Hello, everyone. Um, if we've not met, my name is John, and I'm part of the team here at All Saints. We are today in the second of a two-part mini-series looking at the opening chapters of Joshua and thinking about what they have to tell us about how to approach being church and the vision that we have as a church for the coming months and indeed years ahead. If you were not here last week when Donna set out kind of where we're going in the next six months or so, um, I would recommend giving it a listen back. You can find it on the church website or on any podcasting platform, Spotify or anywhere like that. But to bring people up to speed, when we did a Vision Sunday last time, last week, Donna set out the idea that rather than a vision just being a tick list of things to do, we're going to do this thing, that initiative, start this program, run that course, actually we were going to take a different approach. That rather than it just being a tick list of things to get done, we were going to try and spend the time going deeper, deeper in our faith, deeper in our understanding of who God is, through greater focus on prayer, on the reading and understanding of scripture, of spending time with each other in fellowship. Now in some ways, that seems fairly nebulous, but actually in many ways that makes it more challenging. Having a to-do list gives you something to work through. You can track it in a spreadsheet and see how we're doing in terms of progress. When we talk about going deeper with God, there's no obvious metric by which to measure that. It requires something different, but nonetheless, it needs us to be bold and courageous as Joshua and the Israelites were. And so we, where we pick up the story this week, the Israelites have been wandering fairly aimlessly in the desert for about 40 years or so under primarily the leadership of Moses. We join them parked on the east bank of the Jordan River, camped there for several days, if not longer, waiting, having waited for 40 years already and waiting some more. And in today's reading, something changes. They move forward, stepping into the promise that God had given them years and years before. When we look at how they approach this movement into the land that God had promised, it's worth looking at what they do. The starting point is when you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests, the priests from the tribe of Levi, carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. The Ark of the Covenant, for anyone not familiar with the Indiana Jones movies, was an enormous wooden box clad in gold with statues on either end, and in it were found the original tablets of the Ten Commandments, the rod of Aaron the priest, a jar of manna, and the law of Moses. These four objects representing the promise of God to them and his presence with them in all the years that preceded it. And the ark goes before them. It doesn't bring up the rear as a make sure you don't leave that behind, nor is it right in the middle hidden from everything. It's right out in front. The path into the future begins with following the presence of God. The Ark of the Covenant is an item and a focus of worship. And it goes out in front. Just in many ways as we, together, today, gather at the beginning of a week. To say at the beginning, God goes before us. That it's not that somehow God is bringing up the rear and muddling along. God goes before us into whatever is coming up. 
But of course, it's not just about being here in church on a Sunday. That's not just what we mean when we talk about God going before us. It's about saying, in my life, do I start with God? Or is God an afterthought and also ran? Do we put him at the beginning of all things, at the head of the list of things, the head of the priorities? And we'll cycle back to that in a moment. But it's also worth noting that what happens here in the stepping into the future for the Israelites is a stepping out of a place of familiarity. They have been wandering for more than a generation. There are very few people left amongst them who left Egypt 40 years before. To step into the future is to step out of a past that has become comfortable, to step out of a present that has become familiar and step forward into the unknown. As a church, I think we have done this relatively well over the last few years. There is now more going on than ever before. Major projects undertaken. Two new services started in the last three years. And over the course of the last week or two, I've been keeping a vague eye. We have about 15 or 20 kids in church on a Sunday. There are a substantial number of churches in this country who would kill to have 15 or 20 people, let alone 15 or 20 children. And that is a mark of our willingness, your willingness, to step forward in faith, to step out of the comfortable Many people came when this service began from churches they'd been in for years and said, we're going to step into something new that God is calling us to and that we can bring something to and enrich. Because this is not just about the people at the top. It's very easy when we talk about vision and strategy and plan to think, Really, it's for the Joshuas. It's for the people at the top of the pack. It's Joshua and Caleb and those guys. It's Donna. It's the PCC. It's the church leadership and the staff. It's, it's their thing. And it is their thing. But it's not just their thing. The passage that Al read to us ends by saying... All Israel passed by until the whole nation had completed the crossing. Every single person, from the baby born that morning to the person who would die that night, all of them crossed the Jordan together. It doesn't matter whether you have been a Christian for decades or this is your first time in a church, well, ever. The call is still the same, to step out of the comfortable and the familiar and to push into something new, to step into a new walk with God. Now exactly what that looks like on the ground will look different for all of us. Each of us lives complex and unique lives. Each of us, I suspect, has had complex and unique spiritual journeys throughout those lives. So there's no one-size-fits-all answer to what does it look like for me to step into the future. Other than to put God at the front. Some things that we might want to think about, though, as a place to begin at the heart of which is the idea of giving. Giving is about putting something or someone else first. When I give a present, yes, I might feel a nice warm fuzzy feeling if it goes well, but at the end of the day, it's for someone else. It's not for me. And there are various things that we can give. 
The first of which I think, and often overlooked, is time. Time is our single most precious resource. If I lose my wallet, I can make more money. If my car is stolen, I can get a new one. If my time is gone, there's no getting it back. Giving of our time is essential in how we give to God. That might mean in terms of making attending on a Sunday a top priority on the things that we do. It might be saying, where am I spending time outside of that hour and a half window to be with God, to meet with God? It might be asking the question, where else can I serve? Either within these walls or in the wider community that works to bring glory to God. Giving of our time is an essential part of our walk with Christ. But it's not just about time. When we talk about giving, we cannot avoid talking about money. When we drew up the list of who was preaching when, and I was down to do Giving Sunday, the Sunday after Vision, and I knew that was about money, I kind of went, oh, I don't want to talk about money. No one wants to hear about money. And I think the church has had a bad rap for talking about money, if I'm honest. But as I've thought about it over the course of the last couple of months, the more I've come to realize that actually, yes, it's important. Jesus talks about money and wealth more than any other moral issue. By far, the largest amount of his teachings about ethics are about how we use and how we value our money. And I think it's important also that we don't always hear about money from Donna. Although I think it is good, there is a point where Donna gets up and says, we're going to talk about money, and everyone goes, oh, here's the vicar doing the Bob Geldof impression again, and kind of glaze over. And so, as I go through the next few things, I want you to say it, and I want it to be heard, not as this is the position of Donna or the church or anything, but this is simply me, one Christian, on his walk with Christ, talking to others. When we talk about giving, we have to start with why. Why do we give? Why do we give materially, financially? Because the simple truth is that God does not need your money. God is not short of cash. Everything in heaven and earth belongs to him. And nor is it that the church needs it. Yes, it's lovely and amazing and such a blessing to have this building and the resources that we have. But if push came to shove and the church building crumbled and all the electrics broke, and we had to lay off all the staff, we'd still be able to meet together and worship God. The church would still be there. So why do we give? We give as an act of worship. We give as an act of love. We give because no matter how complex and unique our life has been, all of us fall short of the glory of God. All of us need saving from ourselves and from the world. The good news, of course, of Jesus is that in him, God comes to die the death that we deserve to take our sin onto himself so that we can receive from him the promise of eternal life and abundant life now. 
and that his presence will abide with us and remain with us through the power of the Holy Spirit day by day by day by day. We give as a response, not as a requirement. We don't give out of duty or compulsion or to win cosmic brownie points with God. We give because no matter how much we give, we will never outgive God. When Jesus calls people to follow him, consistently in all four Gospels, the call is complete. Leave everything and follow me. Some people take him up on that offer and others don't, but it's consistent. Either you're all in or you're not. And if we're really all in, if we're really seeking to follow closely in the footsteps of Jesus, then that must include our whole being, our bodies, our minds, and our money. One of the most common metaphors in the Bible for the relationship between God and his people is that of a marriage, of God the bridegroom and his people the bride. A marriage is at its heart and at its best a mutual sharing, a giving of oneself to the other. And that includes everything. The Anglican liturgy, and I know it's the same in some other denominations, says, all that I am I give to you and all that I have I share with you. That is the model of our relationship with God. He gives us, shares with us everything And our response ought to be the same, to respond to that outpouring of love with our own outpouring of love, to respond to God in his willingness to put us first, to put him first. As Jesus said, where your treasure is, there will your heart be also. Where do we store treasure for ourselves? So the why we give because we love. Then the what. What do I give? What is the right amount that I should give? Books and books and books are written on this. And I don't think there's a simple answer because all of our circumstances are unique. Some of us are probably fairly comfortable at present. For others, it may be that money is a source of constant worry and pain. And so I can't give you a simple answer. How much you should give or could give is down to you, to God, to your bank manager maybe. There is a biblical principle which I think is a useful starting point to think on, and that is the principle of tithing. Now, tithing is an ancient practice of giving 10% of one's wealth away. And I won't go into the complex and rich history of it, but we find it right back as far as Genesis. The 10% isn't a magic number, but it's a number that is useful to start from because it is a pretty typical number where if you're giving that away, you start to notice it. Now, I'm lucky, I could chip in 20 pounds into the collection at the end of the service and go home and never really think about it. If that's my giving, then I would suggest that maybe I'm not giving enough. For other people, 20 pounds might be all they've got for days, in which case it would be ludicrously large amounts of money. This is about saying, 
we need to look at ourselves, look at our lives, look at our hearts, and say, what can I give? What can I bring as an offering to God? And I don't give to get back again. There are peculiar corners of the church that like to peddle the idea that if you give money to God, you'll suddenly become a millionaire. That's not how it works. That's not how Jesus says it works. That's not how it works for any single person in the entirety of Scripture. We don't give to get. We give because we already have. And what we give may well change. And it's good to review from time to time. I certainly know throughout our life um, and our time as a family, there have been times where we've given far more than other times. There have been times where we have given a full tithe and then a little bit more. And there have been times where we've given very little because money was tight and things were difficult. And that's okay. In a minute, Donna's going to come up and do the, the how of this. How do we approach giving practically as a church? And that offers us a moment to pause and to reflect. To say, where am I today? Where's my life at? Where's my wealth at? Where's my heart at? Maybe it's that you already give and actually you're overstretched and that's causing you stress and pain, in which case this might be a moment to check that. Or it might be that you think, actually, I do give, but I could give a little bit more, in which case this is a great moment to step into that future. Now, if you are new or a visitor, obviously please do not feel that this is a compulsion or a trying drive to get money for the church. That's not the point. It's not about the church needs money. It's about we need God. We need grace. And we respond to that through giving all of ourselves. Every part of us. Leaving nothing in the tents back on the shore of the Jordan but crossing all of us with all that we are. Because God gave all of us all that he is. Amen.